Hi everybody, Jeff Yastin here and welcome back to another edition of Wealth Press TV. Remember to like and subscribe, follow us on social media and also welcome our guest back, James West, the man of the hour for cannabis stocks. James, welcome back. Hey Jeff, it's always a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. And James, you know, it's great to have you on the show now because as, as you know, cannabis stocks have had a great run uh, of late, and especially since the outcome of the Georgia Senate races uh, became known a handful of weeks ago, and most of the of the whole uh, cannabis sector has started to move uh, broadly higher here. So bring us up to date on your thinking about where we are and what this all means. Well, Jeff, I can tell you that I have never been more excited about the cannabis uh, publicly traded industry than I, I am now. And that is because if you look at the whole history of publicly traded cannabis stocks, which only got its start in 2015, in 2015, there were five publicly traded cannabis stocks in the entire world. And now fast forward a mere five years, and we've got over a thousand publicly traded cannabis and cannabis related companies. James, I, I just have to stop you there. Are you saying that there are a thousand publicly traded cannabis stocks out there right now? There are, and a lot of them are under the radar because a lot of them haven't had, been able to move sideways up or down because the, the cannabis publicly traded realm has been characterized so far by two major waves, each of which have concluded in massive sudden uh, corrections, which persist much longer than, say, the correction that happened in the in the S and P back in March lasted for all of what five minutes before stocks were back, setting new record levels in the yes. cannabis industry. When those prices collapse, the discount was way more than thirty percent. In some cases, it was up to seventy percent, and in many cases, it swallowed whole dozens of companies with them that never recovered, could never raise any more money, had raised too much money at cheap prices. And so we are on the cusp of this third wave, which, as you mentioned, has gotten started since the, start, since the election of the Biden-Harris ticket. Now, that was up until that actually happened. That was, that was not broadly anticipated. We knew that Trump had, was more or less indifferent to the cannabis space, though I'm sure he would have fared better in the election had he been a more vocal supporter of it. That's neither here nor there now. But there's two things that happened in that election that have created an unexpectedly robust sort of bull market behind the cannabis names that is just getting up ahead of steam now. First was the successful campaign by the Democratic Party, who was very vocally more cannabis oriented. But then there was the surprise sugar on top bonus of the Democrats gaining control of Congress, which was nobody saw that coming. Everybody pretty much expected that to stay red and it went blue. So now we have the cannabis centric federal government of the United States now in charge of all three branches of government, which more or less paves the way for them to do as they see fit when it comes to cannabis regulations. Now, Besides the opportunities inherent in a federal uh, framework to regulate cannabis companies on the medical side and on the recreational side, there are two big, big, big opportunities that aren't really broadly understood yet are A, the opening of interstate commerce for cannabis companies, which has been simply impossible because of the nature of cannabis laws. You can grow cannabis in California as a cannabis company, and you can grow cannabis in Florida as a cannabis company, but you can't grow cannabis in California and ship it to Florida, nor can you grow, nor can you make gummies in Florida and ship them to California. So those economies of scale that are inherent in the scale deficiencies of, of a national sort of approach to the and market. James, James, just to clarify here, what you're saying is that federal law regarding interstate commerce and the moving of money over state lines, uh, with, uh, which would apply to federal banking laws, all of that is essentially prohibited 
by uh, existing federal legislation right now. Absolutely. So that's now, that's one of the opportunities that we'll see. I mean, it's now, it's not, it's not a given that the, the cannabis agenda is going to drive the, the legislative agenda of the Kamala Harris office at this point. However, that's one of the opportunities. But the bigger opportunity, the major opportunity that is as yet completely unheralded by any media whatsoever, be it mainstream or alternative, is the fact that if cannabis is finally recognized for its medicinal properties by the federal government of the United States and its medical regulatory body, the FDA, this now opens up the potential for widespread development and clinical trials and experimentation and access to medical cannabis for the whole biopharmaceutical industry and not well known or well actually published is the idea that back in the, before, before cannabis became the target of a concerted industrial conspiracy to remove it from the American pharmacopoeia, cannabis was actually one of the dominant ingredients in almost all pharmaceutical ingredients from head colds to menstrual pain to all of the things that we're just starting to re-recognize re that it's actually very effective for without any of the toxicity, side effects, or addictiveness of the chemical biotech industry, which only achieved its dominance because of the war waged against cannabis going back as far as the 50s that just completely obliterated cannabis from the American pharmacopoeia, the global pharmacopoeia by extension, and here we are on the cusp of FDA recognition of its medical value. And that has billion trillion dollar implications for the future of cannabis as a medical product. Okay, so James, uh, sort of paint the rest of this picture for us regarding the, the cannabis sector, because you know those stocks had a great run a handful of years ago. And then as you pointed out, there was this collapse on the part of, of almost all the stocks in that sector as uh, they fell down to extremely low valuation levels. Now we've had something of an uptrend and the uh, be beginnings of a, a more positive backdrop for the industry. So what is gonna take it to the next level, make sure this is a sustainable move, not just you know, for the next month or two, but for six months, a year, two years, five years out as a, a real growing industry would. Sure, well, so in this onset of the third wave, the, the major weaknesses in the two waves that caused such drastic devaluations during the corrective phases is associated with the inherent weakness in the Canadian regulatory uh, landscape. So in Canada, all of these cannabis companies the, and, and in the entire publicly traded industry in Canada the promoters who organize a company sprinkle vast numbers of shares among their near and dear, all the people who help them in their sort of ability to create this wave of demand in the investor marketplace and then sell all of their cheap paper into it. That's what happens when the industry is dominated by Canadian publicly traded companies. And that is what was the main driving force behind the massive sell-offs in the whole industry across the board in both of the second, uh, both the first and second sell-off, the first one of which happened in 2017 and the second one happened in 2019. But again, what has changed is this is now an American game. It was a Canadian game, but now it's an American game. So two things that are gonna make this thing more sustainable. A, the SEC is a much more fearsome regulator than is any of the Ontario provincial regulators. And we don't have a federal regulator, which only plays into the, into the palms of the promoters who just blow out cheap paper all day long, which causes, which immediately caps the ability of these companies to rise in price. They puts, puts a cap on their limit. People don't understand that. And people fail to grasp that the capital structure is the most important thing when you buy the stock or when you're going to sell it. And most people don't even think of that. So the American audience is better regulated on the regulatory side. You can't go out there and say you're going to be the biggest cannabis producer with the cheapest all-in cost per gram with the highest quality weed, which is what 
every single Canadian cannabis company was running around telling investors, you can't do that in the United States without future legal jeopardy. Because if your investors decide that you are misleading them, then they can sue you. And the SEC will jump on that suit. And possibly the FBI and even the U.S. Postal Service will come after you. But uh, so these... These are all the factors that now that it's a U.S. game, A, the market in the U.S. is 10 times bigger. With federal regulation, it's going to be the playground of the largest capital pools. Hedge funds aren't really in this game yet. The billion-dollar companies aren't there yet. So this is going to be a much longer and sustainable rise. The valuations will be much higher than we've seen yet in the entire cannabis space. And the resilience of the pricing will remain intact far longer than it has when it was Canadian dominated because the era of the cheap promoted low price stock being distributed to promoters who really don't care about the company at all is kind of over now because the U.S. has taken over. So those are all the things that are going to make it bigger. James, what about uh, profits? Uh, I, I can remember a few years ago looking in depth at some of these, uh, basically all these cannabis stocks and uh, almost none of them had real profits to, to speak of at that point. Is it your sense that they are doing better on that job in terms of generating profits or being at least on the path to profitability? Because you know, to me, that's really what sustains a move higher in any stock ultimately is profits and the, the building up of equity within the company for shareholders. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, that's, again, a story of individual nations. In, the, in Canada, profitability has been elusive for the major uh, cannabis companies because they are hamstrung by regulations, despite the fact that it's legal, A. And B, the regulations have, in Canada, left the door wide open for black market growers and producers of cannabis products to compete successfully against the regulated corporate producers. And this is a fundamental flaw in the Canadian rollout and the hurry to roll out the federal regulatory regime that resulted in a Supreme Court challenge that at the, when the smoke cleared, anybody who had the right to grow cannabis medically was, they were, they, they tried to take the right of that individual to grow their own and force them into the corporate world. Well, there was a constitutional challenge on that ground uh, the, this, some of the challengers said that this represents a financial hardship for us to buy corporate marijuana at a cost of $7 per gram, where I have been growing my own medicine for the last 10 years under alternative regimes for less than 50 cents a gram. The judge agreed and grandfathered into the entire thing that anybody who has a license to grow cannabis or has a prescription to grow cannabis can continue to grow their own cannabis. And that has caused a big cottage industry underground where people have prescriptions for large quantities of cannabis that they then sell into the gray market. I myself have a prescription for 95 grams of dried cannabis per day. I have a permit from Health Canada to have growing at any given time up to 463 cannabis plants indoors. Well, I can tell you, Jeff, that that I mean, that ability, it's great for me because I'm, I'm growing that quantity of cannabis to access the CBD, not the THC. The entire regime is regulated by its THC content, which is what most people are after. For me to get the CBD levels I need, I need a plant that yields 95 grams per day of THC, which for me is a waste product. And so... There are lots of guys like me who have these massive prescriptions who are now just selling that marijuana in the black market. And that's the main reason uh, why profitability has eluded the Canadians. That with the limitations on advertising in Canada. In the United States, the same thing is kind of responsible. Regulatory overreach in the form of the blockage of interstate commerce is what has prevented U.S. companies from competing effectively in all of these jurisdictions. Now, with the onset of, of, of an imminent U.S. federal regime and the potential for interstate commerce, profitability is much closer. And in fact, the largest cannabis companies in the United States are marginally profitable at this point, but they're building a whole new industry at the same time 
So all these factors come into play. So James, is there a specific pot stock that uh, you would suggest folks uh, look at uh, more carefully here that, that you like? Our feature in my publication, the James West letter this month, and I, I, I can give it away now because we published it last week. So all the subscribers have had a chance to buy it who are inclined. Features a company that was called the Subversive Capital Corporation, Subversive Capital Acquisition Corporation. This was a SPAC that raised $570, $570 million. The principal of the company, the CEO is Michael Auerbach, who is a director of Tilray. And they have merged with Jay-Z's uh, platform. Jay-Z is, I mean, I feel silly having to explain this, but I had to explain <laughs> it to my mother. Jay-Z is a very wealthy and famous uh, pop music icon in the, in the globe, on the global stage. And so this is, again, this is something that major A-list stars refused to align themselves with the cannabis industry until the Democrats won the election because there was always the risk that coming, traveling cross border, that if you, if you came out publicly as an A-list star in favor of cannabis, which some have to their detriment, there was always the increased risk that your plane, your tour bus, your band members could be searched, could be quarantined, could be blocked from entering countries and crossing borders. And the A-listers just don't want that stigma. So they've stayed away. Uh, the parent company, which is Jay-Z's company that merged with Subversive in this SPAC deal worth $570 million. Uh, this is a company that has 10% of the California market in one of its brands called Caliva. They have, uh, they have all these different brands on this platform that are technologically driven. And so this company has all these ingredients that were not formally available to cannabis companies. So you've got Jay-Z as the main, main spokesman. He's the chief brand officer of this company, the chief cannabis officer. You've got him and his entire following now looking at these products. It's merged with a $570 million SPAC. This is the largest SPAC ever in the cannabis industry. And so you've got this convergence of amazing opportunities. This stock's trading at $12.53 a share right now. It would be unheard of for a company to start trading in the cannabis space at $12 a share in the old iterations of 2017, 2019. It just wouldn't happen. This is just, this is just a sign of things to come. The biggest SPAC merging with the, one of the biggest artists in the hip hop space and, and a renowned marketer and very savvy entrepreneur. I mean, this is one of the companies that is very exemplary of what the next third wave in cannabis is gonna look like. These are gonna be billion dollar companies out of the chute. They have the potential to become trillion dollar suppliers of a broad array of cannabis products globally within the next decade. And so that's what we're looking at here is the onset of the trillion dollar cannabis unicorn. James, I'm wondering what your take is on the possibility of mergers and acquisitions in the cannabis sector, because late last year we saw Tilray and Afria, two of the larger companies in the sector, uh, merge. And I've since read some analysts who follow the sector think that we could then see a lot of other companies that are also, you know, players, major players or minor players begin to buy or merge into each other in order to grow larger and take advantage of these, these bigger opportunities. And also it's a sign of a maturity phase for the cannabis industry. What's your take? There is definitely the likelihood of, uh, of, of the merging of certain titans in the industry. Um, you know, like for example, Canopy Growth Corp, can't, the number, the first company that was in the cannabis industry, the one who laid the groundwork for everybody, the first one to be acquired by a New York Stock Exchange listed Fortune 100 company in the form of Constellation, or Fortune 500, not Fortune 100, Constellation Brands, the makers of Corona Beer, bought control of Canopy Growth Corp for $4 billion. And by all accounts, this was a disastrous acquisition because Canopy still has not been able to achieve profitability. In fact, 
it's experiencing write down after write down after write down. So is Canopy ripe for consolidation with something bigger? Do you think that Constellation brands might be looking to get out of the recreational cannabis space in Canada by selling its its Canopy brand. Now, Canopy does have some footprint in the United States as well. However, it's not nearly as well as established as the Canadian or rather the U.S. incumbents in the space like Purely, Truly and uh, Green Thumb Industries, for example. James, let's talk about growth markets here in terms of where the cannabis industry can expand further globally, because I've read that uh, Mexico is looking at uh, the possibility of, of legalization or, or further decriminalization of uh, cannabis. And likewise, for much of Latin America, that some of this is on the table as well. And these are all parts of the world that are historically you know, hostile towards uh, the use of the regular use of, of cannabis. There are opportunities internationally, but, uh, you know, Mexico is a great example. Mexico has tried to legalize cannabis twice, but every time because of the heavy bureaucratic load and the very partisan nature of the politics in Mexico, every time they are just about to legalize it, a new government gets in and they throw out all the regulations from the past government because they're trying to sort of massage the regulations to suit their own party. This is just what's going on here with the current Mexican administration as well. And so when it comes to the idea that a U.S. company might seek to set foot in the Mexican market, the cannabis industry is not very amenable to allowing external players into their national markets. And the reason is because every government wants, in exchange for legalizing cannabis, they want access to the tax base on the most maximum level possible that legalizing cannabis is supposed to bring them. So if they let foreign competitors in, that minimizes their ability to tax the cannabis industry locally if, they're, if they inadvertently suppress it by allowing foreign domination of their markets. So this is one of the things I've noticed in all national markets is the government is always moving toward making its own producers of cannabis and cannabis products dominant. James, you mentioned a moment ago about Constellation buying Canopy Growth. And, uh, you know, that particular acquisition didn't work out that well. But would you expect uh, with this uh, more, ma more maturity and uh, the possibility of, a, of more friendly federal legislation here that we would then see uh, some of the larger, you know, S&P 500 companies start buying other cannabis companies in order to participate in that in, in this new and very fast growing industry first of all let me just say that there is a great deal of money moving around behind the scenes that doesn't necessarily follow back to its source easily and what i'm talking about is large pharmaceutical companies have already made inroads into certain select uh cannabis companies and they don't talk about it that much and they're not majority positions because until the regulatory framework globally becomes more uniform and more predictable, the large pharmaceutical companies are not going to expose their share price or their reputations to the risk that at some point we might get a regression in the advancement of cannabis laws in both the medical side or the recreational side that might ultimately cause them harm. And so there's a lot of money already moving around behind the scenes in the space that you just don't, you just don't realize that it's Johnson and Johnson and Pfizer and Roche and, and Sanofi and all of these companies, because they're not, they're not very public with these investments. And they've in fact done through the avenues of investment, they've done taken great measures to obscure their ownership in these companies because of the risk reputationally, legally, and uh, of, of other aspects of it that just could be harmful to their brands. So yeah, there's going to be a lot more investment, but there already has been, and you won't really hear it publicly proclaimed until 
the regulatory landscape is a lot more solid than just theoretical, which it still is, despite the fact that we have a democratic slate, it's still theoretical. Nothing has happened yet. James, I, I subscribe to the idea that stock prices move up or down often in anticipation of future events, you know, good or bad. And I'm wondering if you think then that the, uh, this move we've seen in pot stocks of late will continue in, in fits and starts, you know, just kind of stair-stepping higher over time in anticipation of better things ahead for uh, things like federal legislation that's friendlier to the pot industry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> we're in, the, we're in the, uh, the opening innings of the third wave in the cannabis space. And the third wave is always the biggest wave. And just as in surfing, so it is in cannabis. But so, the, so we're, at, we're at the midpoint in the evolution of the cannabis industry. At the end of the day, the cannabis industry will cease to exist as a separate industry. It will just become another agricultural product in the agricultural industry. It'll become another <clears throat> food or recreational beverage or foodstuff ingredient in the consumer goods space, or it will become a medical ingredient in the biotech space. But cannabis stocks in 10 years will not exist. And this is, the, this is both the opportunity and the risk. So right now, with this big third wave ahead of us, people are watching and saying, well, the regulatory landscape isn't solid yet, so I'm going to wait till it is till I jump in. Well, that's the, that's the typical move of the over-conservative investor who is always going to, yes, have a lot less risk, a lot less volatility by the time they get in, but is also going to miss out on the biggest moves. The biggest moves happen from right now until the point where the, the industry starts to be consolidated into the broader macro industries of which it is a natural member. And that's, so that's where we're going. We're 10 years out from cannabis disappearing as its own industry because it's going to be absorbed by agriculture, biotech, and recreational consumer products. But we're at the forefront of that third wave, which means now is the time to play ball, ride that third wave, but be prepared to you know, keep an eye on these stocks for signs of the consolidation of the industries and, and get out while they're trading at their premiums. James, that's such great advice because I know you see it and I see it all the time as well in that uh, stocks will have huge moves and only after that big first move has happened will the folks at CNBC or the, the more mainstream financial media pick up on these things. So basically, if you're only buying it then, you're buying it at a higher price and you've left a lot of potential profit already on the table. Yeah, absolutely, Jeff. And that's exactly why we are featuring cannabis. Well, we're featuring the cannabis stock that I talked about, the parent company, in our January issue of the James West letter. But we're launching a whole new cannabis product because we are on the cusp of this third wave that is going to be the most enriching portion of the wave to the broadest possible of the investor universe, because now is the time when the largest capital pools can come into the industry with federal regulation and not worried about the damage to their reputations or the risk of regulatory backtracking, because the Democrats are going to firm that up over the next four years. So now is the time, and that's why we've launched that's why we're launching this new service on the back of the James West Letter. Well, James, I, I could not agree more. And that's why it's so great to have you on, because this could be very profitable advice that you're giving here, potentially, as we uh, watch these stocks and as we have this more favorable background for federal legislation and, and all the rest and, and be able to watch these stocks move higher over time. So, James, thank you very much for coming on to Wealth Press TV and giving us your insights on, on the cannabis sector. My pleasure, Jeff. We'll see you soon. And for all of you, remember to like and subscribe to us and follow us on social media. And until next week, I'm Jeff Yastine.